Hey guys, welcome to another Flutter tutorial video. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be looking at how we can use advanced isolates inside of Flutter. Now this slide has been copied from the last isolate tutorial. I highly recommend you go and you check out that tutorial before you look at this video. I'm just going to cover the very basics of isolates here. So isolates and Dart are basically Dart's versions of threads or actors. It's based on the Erlang slash Elixir actor model, and they're essentially just isolated processes. Each one has their own memory heap, and they're isolated from one another. They don't share memory. We can use ports and messages to communicate back and forth between the isolates. This is the part that we're going to be looking at mainly today. We're going to spawn our own isolate inside of a Flutter application, and we're going to have it do a few computations, then spit back the information, and then we'll put that information into a widget. To truly understand why isolates are important, you really need to understand how the Flutter engine is set up. I found that a few people that I try to explain this to don't really get the right idea because they're used to frameworks like React Native. Flutter, on the other hand, is multi-threaded by default. So the Flutter engine itself is split into four task runners, and each of these task runners typically have their own threads. At least that's what the spec says. Now, the actual Flutter engine doesn't really care if some of these task runners end up on the same thread, but in Android and iOS, there are four threads specific to each of the task runners. These four task runners are the platform task runner, which is the main thread, the UI task runner, which runs all of the Dart code, the GPU task runner, which is responsible for expensive GPU computations, and then the IO task runner, which is responsible for the most expensive computations that typically have to do with input and output. This is just a very basic outline of these task runners. I will link a document in the description that you guys can take a look at if you're really curious about the actual configuration of these task runners. So these threads help Flutter avoid jank and slowdown. By distributing the work up in this way, we can avoid some potential problems. So even if you write in optimal code that has potentially blocking features in it, it's not going to block, say, the rendering of the user interface or, you know, your application. It may cause some slowdown if it's a large enough and expensive enough computation. And in those situations, you want to use isolates. So we've got this delegation of power between each of these task runners. And as I mentioned, these prevent the actual application from locking up due to a blocking execution. So here's a visual representation of the actual Flutter framework. Most of it is built in Dart. This is things like the material, the widgets, the rendering engine, the animation, painting, and gestures, and the services. And then we've got this shell, which is in C++. This is the SCA engine, the Dart virtual machine, the engine itself, and then the Mojo layer. Again, if you want to learn a bit more about how the Flutter framework is set up, I will link a much more technical description in the box below. All right, so now let's get into our application. So currently in our app, we've got a simple stateless widget which builds out a material application, and then we've got our stateful widget which builds out an empty scaffold. Let's make the imports that we're going to need for this application. We want to bring in the HTTP library so that we can make our HTTP request. We need to bring in Dart async for our asynchronous processes. We need to bring in Dart isolate, and this will allow us to communicate with a new isolate. And we need to bring in Dart convert so that we can convert the resulting response from JSON into a Dart map. Down inside of the state class for our stateful widget, we'll create a list, and this will just be an empty list. We'll use this to get the messages that we're sending back from our isolate so that we can then use that list to populate our widgets. Now we can override our init state function and inside of it we can call a load isolate function which will be a asynchronous function which doesn't pass back anything. 
This will be the function that we use to actually spawn the isolate that we're going to communicate with. Then we'll create a static function called isolate entry, which will be the actual entry point for our isolate. So this is just the callback function that we're sending into our spawned external isolate, and it's what executes all of the computations that we're sending into this isolate. To help you guys understand what's going on, I'm going to build these functions side by side, and I'll talk about how they're interacting with one another. First, we need to create the receive port for our main isolate, which is the main thread that our Flutter application exists in. The receive port is just a stream, but we've specified that the stream is flowing into our Flutter application from the isolate. So receive means that we're receiving data, whereas send means that we're sending data. Each receive port or send port has a corresponding receive or send port. So our receive port here also has a send port, which we can access using the send port property. And we'll be using this so that we can connect this receive port to the isolate that we're going to spawn. That way we can send messages from our isolate to our main application. And then we'll create a receive port inside of our isolate so that we can send messages from our main application to our isolate. So now we can call await isolate.spawn. We have to put in our entry point, which is our isolate entry. And then we have to put in the message that we want to send to it. And for this function, we actually want to send in a send port. And we'll just call this send port. And to make this work, we just put in isolate entry. And then for the send port part, we put in receive port dot send port, which is the corresponding send port for this receive port stream so we can pass information from the isolate to our main application. Inside of the isolate entry point we want to create a receive port for the isolate so that the isolate can receive messages from our main application. And then like we did with this isolate spawn function where we sent in the send port which is connected to this receive port we want to take this receive port's send port and send it back into our main isolate. So we're going to send it by calling the send method on this send port here. And this will let us just send this send port through the stream that connects it and the receive port inside of our main application. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially this is connected to this. And then this, which is also this, is connected to this. So you can think of them like pipes. We're creating a pipe that allows us to send information from our isolate to our main application. And then we're creating a pipe that allows us to do the opposite. So send information from our main application to our isolate. And we need access to both of these pipes in both our isolate and our main application so that we can get the information as well as send it back. Now we need some way of receiving this message inside of our main isolate or inside of our load isolate function. And we can do this by creating a send port and then setting it equal to an await on the receive port, which is this port, and then the first item that gets sent through the stream, which will be this port.send port. So this will give us access to the send port of this corresponding port here. Now we want to create a go between function called send receive, which will take in a send port and then the message that we want to send. Inside of this function, we'll create a receive port. So every single time it gets called, it creates a new one. And then what we can do is we can send down the send port the message that's being passed into this and then the connection to our response port, so the send port side of our response port. We can return from this execution the first item that gets sent through this response port, which will be this list here. So this allows us to send the message to the isolate as well as get the message back in our main isolate. So now we can call this send receive function. We can pass in the send port, which is the send port for our external isolate, so that this message will be sent to the external isolate. And the message will just be this string, which is the JSON placeholder API 
for the comments. So we'll use this URL to actually call to the API, get the messages, and then send them back to this list here. So now that we've called this function, we can come into our isolate to actually get the information and we can use the await for loop to actually get the information from the port, which is the stream that we're receiving this information from. And we can get the information from this list here by just calling the indexes of the list. So first we get the actual message at the zeroth index, and then we get the send port at the first index. And now to complete this logic, we can create a new HTTP response by awaiting on a HTTP GET request on the URL that we're sending in here. And then we can send that information back to our main isolate by calling on the send port, which is the reply port, calling send, and then calling json.decode on the response body, and then pushing it back into our load isolate. So this comes back through as this message variable. If we take a look at our API and the JSON that we would get back from the API, you can see here that we've got quite a few JSON objects. In fact, we've got 500 that come from this endpoint. Each one has its own set of fields. We're only going to worry about the body field because it's just a blob of text. But even with 500 JSON maps being decoded all at once, this computation isn't actually expensive enough for us to justify using the isolate. You would have to have extremely large nested JSON objects to really justify what we're doing in this application. To complete this function, we want to take our list from the global variable at the top, and we want to feed our message list of map into this list so that we can then query the list and put the data into our widgets. Now we can create a function which will programmatically create the actual body for our scaffold. So we want to check to see if our global list length is equal to zero. And when it's equal to zero, what we'll do is we'll return a center which has a circular progress indicator inside of it. So this will make it look like it's loading. And then after our JSON gets parsed by the isolate and it populates the list, we can then create a list view which will have all of the items from this list inside of it. So here we can say return listview.builder. We'll put in the item count which will be our list.length and then we'll have our item builder. Inside of our item builder, we pass in the build context and then the actual index of the item that we're iterating through. And then we're gonna return a container for each item. This we can give our container some padding. And then the child of each container will be a text widget, which will take our list, take the index of the current widget that we're looking at, and then grab the assigned body key. So this is the body key from the JSON, and this will just populate it with a bunch of random text. Now we can come down into our build function, and in our scaffold, we can create an app bar. And I'll just put in some text, which will say advanced isolate example. And then the body for this scaffold will be a call to our load data function. All right, so now here's our application. You can see we've got quite a lot of filler text in here. There are 500 different items. Each one starts with item colon, and then it has the filler text that's being pulled from the API and we're pulling all of those items in all at once using the isolate. If I reload the application, you can see that it takes maybe half a second, maybe even less than that, to pull in all of this data. So even in this case, using the isolate is a little bit excessive. The reason why I did it in this tutorial is because I wanted to show you guys how to do it if you ever come across a computation that does require it. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you disliked the video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.